So what then should a code of ethics be? What should it do? Well, of course, we have to have an ethical approach to what we do, but we equally don't want to put up prohibitive ba barriers that actually stop us doing the work that we want to do, stop us doing sensible learning analytics. So an ethics code needs to be a living, breathing document, something that is evolving all the time. JISC put in place a code of practice at a very early stage of our journey in learning analytics, but it is a living document subject to amendment, something that we need to reinterpret as our practice develops. So what then are the major headings, the major subject areas that should be in a code of practice? So firstly, responsibility. Learning analytics collects sources of data from a wide range of departments within a complex organization like a university and a college. People involved range from people who are at the rock face of collecting data through to people uh, who analyze that data, record it and pass it on. So a first key area for any uh, code of ethics is to be very clear and transparent about where that responsibility lies. The code of ethics needs to identify who is responsible, define the extent of that responsibility, and be quite clear and unambiguous about it so that that responsibility can be mapped onto a particular person's job responsibilities and professional obligations. Transparency. Well, transparency is about openness and honesty. We expect transparency in any public organization or in any organization that holds information about us. So transparency is about very, being very clear and open about what we're doing. So the person who ultimately owns their data is very clear about where it's being used and where it's going. So a code of ethics should define what that means in terms of an institution. Uh, how much are we making people aware of what we're doing, aware of our responsibilities, aware of our obligations and their rights? Consent. Consent is getting more complicated. So informed consent is essential uh, for many legal processes in terms of data protection uh, and is also generally accepted as an ethical thing to do. So in other words, we have to make sure that the students from whom we're collecting the information have given a form of consent. But consent is getting more and more legally complicated because there's a recognition that consent is also about power. So for example, you can't really say that a person has given unconstrained consent if a condition for them joining the university in the first place is they tick the box to surrender their data. So this is an area that's quite volatile and under consideration. So we would expect a code of ethics translated into practice to certainly mention informed consent. But this is one of those areas that's alive and changing and we need to make sure that we're on top of those changes as they develop. Privacy. Everybody has a right to privacy. Now privacy here, when we're considering ethics and practice, needs to be differentiated from de-identification. So de-identification is really important when it comes to releasing personal information to different levels within an organization. But de-identification is not in itself a, a substitute for privacy. So when a student necessarily releases their personal data to their teacher, for example, who has to have access to their individual sets of data, that teacher has a significant number of privacy responsibilities in terms of both ethics and practice. A lot of data is sensitive. So for example, a teacher might need to know about a person's disabilities, but that right to know doesn't extend their right to share that information without consent to others. People need to be sensitive to that. People need to be sensitive to the political environment on key indicators of identity, for example, that can compromise a person in the world. So if we're not ever mindful of privacy, we are likely to violate the trust that we have with an individual, which is essential for learning analytics. Validity. Validity is about a cluster of issues. It obviously includes accuracy. We want our information to be accurate. Inaccurate information is simply wrong. But it's more than just accuracy. Uh, it's about recognizing the danger of gaps in the data set, for example, which might have implications. It's about recognizing that uh, inappropriate correlations can be made that imply a cause-effect relationship. If those get into a system, then the learning analytics system lacks validity and we come to false conclusions. Uh, 
So validity extends the concept of accuracy into the process of analysis and the process of reporting. The reason why it's an ethical concern that underlines a code of practice is that invalid data can have very severe consequences. Very clearly, an invalid data record can have very serious consequences for an individual student. If the mark is incorrect, the student can fail the degree. So there's obviously a key interest in validity there. But validity also extends to the public implications uh, that we draw from information. So at the opposite end of the spectrum, if we take something like the teaching excellence framework, for example, that depends on the validity of the data sets that originate in individual institutions. If those aren't valid, then the public is going to draw quite wrong conclusions about the implications of the relative value of different institutions, and potential students might make inappropriate choices in what are what some of the most important investments in their lives. So validity goes to the heart of the trust that we can expect in the system and the value of that system, both to individuals, organizations, but also to society at large. Access. Now remember that learning analytics depends on individual students surrendering their rights over their personal information and shifts the responsibility onto the organization to use that information appropriately. So it follows from this that individual students have a right of access uh, to how we're using that data and the way that we're interpreting it. And a code of ethics translated into a code of practice must allow for appropriate access. It doesn't from this follow that a student will have access to everything that an organization knows about them or deduces about them. For example, if the outcome of the analysis might be harmful for the student, the institution might have a reason not to tell the student that that is their conclusion. But the code of ethics must translate into practices that allow that to be done on an everyday basis in a consistent, fair and reasonable manner. Positive interventions. Now remember that the key purpose of learning analytics is to improve the student experience and to improve the learning environment. That word improvement runs through everything that we do. So it's ethical to expect that the application of learning analytics will lead to positive outcomes. Ethics and the code of practice that follows from this needs to ensure that we understand what those are and also that it defines what form those interventions will take uh, as we move forward. Um, that will depend on the individual institution. So the code of ethics will set that out in broad terms, but the individual institution needs to define what form of interventions it's em envisaging how it's going to put them in practice, and how always those are going to lead to positive outcomes that are appropriate to the mission of that institution in particular. In turn, positive interventions depend on appropriate resourcing. So you can't institute a program of learning analytics, make promises to your students and make promises to your staff, and then find that you have inadequate resources to carry out those interventions. Not only that is a betrayal of trust, it's unethical, because promises have been made that can't be met. This is why it's essential that the decision to implement learning analytics is made at the highest level of the institution to ensure that appropriate resources are put behind the interventions that will follow. Don't promise students interventions based on their analytic results that then as an institution you can't meet. Avoiding adverse impact. This is a really important part of ethical practice that needs to be translated into the way we behave, um, our codes of practice. Clearly, monitoring something always runs the risk of the intervention affecting the behavior. And whenever we're thinking about how we use learning analytics, we've got to be very careful that people don't respond by trying to game the system or that we don't induce adverse behavior in people. Um, by the process of monitoring and reporting that we put in place. This must be defined in terms of the particular level uh, and the particular application of learning analytics. So for example, if for our educators, our teachers, uh, we set uh, job performance goals that uh, require very, very specific outcomes, we mustn't create a situation where the use of learning analytics distorts the value of the teaching simply to achieve the monitored outcomes. At the organizational level, 
where we have national indicators, for example, uh, such as the teaching excellence framework, we need to avoid the tendency of institutions to drive their whole policies towards achieving better scores on these sorts of narrow outcomes. Now, it's a very familiar problem across all aspects of education, whether we're talking about the way we measure performance in primary schools or the way that we measure uh, performance uh, in universities. And that difficulty, which we're well aware of, goes back into the heart of learning analytics and is why it has such an important part to play in a code of practice. Stewardship is a really important part of uh, any data-driven organization. It also relates to data literacy. It also relates to the whole concept um, of a data culture within an institution. Stewardship is our responsibility as the custodians of data. It may not have originated with us, it may not belong to us, but when we hold it, we have a clear set of responsibilities for it, uh, which extend to making sure that it is used appropriately, making sure it's accurate and valid, uh, making sure that it is not passed on inappropriately to third parties, but equally making sure that when necessarily it is deleted or destroyed. And those stewardship rules need to be very clearly set out uh, within the code of ethics and the code of practice. There's naturally a tendency to think that data is owned or the responsibility of somebody else, maybe somebody in the IT department or someone in the registrar's department. What data stewardship tells us is in our complicated organizations such as colleges and universities, very many people are data stewards. And we need to set out very clearly the ways in which they should fulfill those responsibilities. Overall, codes of ethical practice should be living, breathing documents that make sense in the world. They should be things that we think about that are sensible. They shouldn't be prescriptive documents that stop us doing things. They shouldn't be rules and they shouldn't be regulations. We want an environment where we're free to innovate, where we're free to put in place new systems, where we're free to do things that improve the quality of learning. That's why it's so important that an ethical code is something that is actively discussed, actively worked on, actively changed to changing circumstances. At the end of the day, it's a document that keeps us honest, keeps us on focus, keeps us directed towards our primary purposes of doing good.